Okay, our text is out of 2 Kings 23 and 2 Chronicles 36, King Jehoahaz and King Jehoiakim. Uh, I forget whose picture that is of. I don't know if that's King Jehoaz or King Jehoiakim. It's, it's one or the other anyway. And uh, they reigned. They were Joash's son. And so they're at the very end here. We're going to do both of them tonight. Uh, still during the time of Jeremiah prophesying. And again, son of, sons of Josiah. A little overlapping with Josiah in 2 Chronicles 34, 35, verse 23. Uh, the archers shot King Joha, jo, jo, Josiah at Megiddo, and he was brought to Jerusalem, and he died and was buried with his fathers. Right, uh, Nacho, king of Egypt, was coming, just traveling through Israel on his way towards Assyria, over towards the Euphrates River, to war um, there, and Josiah decides he's going to stop him for some reason, and he goes out to meet him. And King Nico of, of Egypt says, no, leave me alone. Just let me pass through. This war has nothing to do with you. Uh, Josiah refuses to listen, and he gets killed there. Archer shoot him there at Megiddo and dies in Jerusalem. So that's where we pick up tonight. Verse 2 Kings 23, verse 30, The people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in his father's place. Jehoaz was 23 years old when he became king, and he reigned a total of three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamathul, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers had done. Now, obviously not his father, Josiah, because Josiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord all of his days, except that uh, last thing of not listening to Nico and, and uh, going to battle when he shouldn't have. Um, and so uh, Josiah reigned, he began at eight years old, and he reigned for 31 years and died so at the end of 39 and that means Jehoahaz was born when Josiah was, what, about 16 or so. And so, uh, and that's when jo, uh, Josiah was really having a spiritual revival in his life, as we read in the text about him. Again, began to reign when he was eight, when he was in about his eighth year. Uh, he, they found the Bible, he was reading the Bible, he gave his heart to the Lord, he sought the Lord and began a reformation in the land. And that's when his first son, or this son anyway, is born. And so this son is raised 23 years under good King Josiah's rule. While King Josiah is having a revival in his life spiritually and a revival in the country, they're holding Passovers, they're inviting other people from other places to come and join them. And God is working mightily. They're getting rid of the idols. They're getting rid of all the false things. And um, he sees all of that. He sees all that happening. He's raised under those circumstances for 23 years. And he becomes king. And he does what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, it might have been because of his mother, uh, you know, other than her name and, and uh, her father's name. We don't know much about her. Or he might have just made his own choices. They were bad choices. And God allows him to reign only three months. Pretty sad. 23, he's got his whole life ahead of him. Could have done a lot of good. Could have continued the reforms that his father had started and led Judea on a right path. Instead, he does evil in the sight of the Lord. It doesn't say what he does, because he wasn't there long enough to really know what he does, but he does evil in the sight of the Lord. Pharaoh Necho put him in prison at Reblah in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem, and he imposed on the land a tribute of 100 talents of silver and a talent of gold. 
Now, how does Pharaoh get to do that? How, how does he just all of a sudden take this king and say, you're not king of Israel, Judah. You're not going to be king anymore. You're not going to reign in Jerusalem anymore. Take him and put him in prison. And then lay tribute. How can he do that? Where does he get off doing that? Well, he won the battle of Megiddo. And as we studied last week, whoever wins the battle of Megiddo controls the land. A, it was a crucial, crucial place to control. And that's why in Revelation, the last battle between God and Satan is called Har Megiddo, even though there is no mountain Megiddo, but Har Megiddo because it's the mountain of battles. And again, whoever wins that battle between God and Satan controls the universe. And so since Pharaoh won that battle, even though he wasn't even looking for that battle, Josiah went out and thus lost the land more than Pharaoh gained the land. But since he lost it, he gave it up, literally. He didn't have to enter that battle at all. Pharaoh now rules the land. And gets to decide who's king and who's not. And so he takes him out. And then imposes the tribute. I now own that strait. I now own Megiddo. I now control it. You want to travel around your country? You want people to come through and trade? Then pay me a tribute. Or I'm locking it up. Verse 34, Pharaoh took Jehoahaz to Egypt and he died there. So he takes this king, son of Josiah, takes him out of Jerusalem after three months, puts him in prison for a time, and then takes him to, to Egypt and he dies there. That's it. All it's written. We don't know how long he lived in Egypt. We don't know how long he languished there. We don't know what kind of conditions it was under, but he died there. Doesn't seem he lived long. Maybe he was broken hearted, 23 years old. We don't know if he had remorse. I don't know if he repented. He had a good example in his father, so he knew right. He knew what he could have done to, to at least receive forgiveness, to at least receive salvation. The sanctuary services had been reestablished under Josiah. So he knew about the lambs, he knew about the sacrifices. He knew about the forgiveness of sins. He knew about the mercy of God. He knew about God's grace. He knew about atonement. At least he had been taught. He knew that he could receive God's grace, God's cleansing, and a new heart, and new life. All pointing forward to the Messiah to come. That he could receive God's spirit into his heart and mind and live a new life. And maybe he did that in Egypt. Maybe he did that in prison in wherever that city was. But it doesn't say it. The Bible record is empty. And the only words we have is that he did evil in the sight of the Lord, reigns three months, and dies in Egypt. And that's it. A short eulogy for him. So then Pharaoh Necho made Elohim, the son of Josiah, king in place of his father, Josiah, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. And again, he's in charge. He can do whatever he wants. He can put in, take out a king, put in a king, change his name, whatever he wants. And I guess that's, so that's Jehoiakim. And the other one was Jehoiaz. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began King King. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Now, so he's also Josiah's son. He's maybe uh, about two years older than his brother. We don't know why the Pharaoh thought that he would be better there than his brother there. We don't know why he took out his brother after three months. Maybe he refused to pay the tribute to, the, 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 the tribute to, to, to Egypt. Maybe this guy said, I'd be willing to. 
Maybe he paid off Pharaoh and said, I don't like my brother anyway. I'll give you this if you put me in and take him out. The Bible doesn't say. Lots of that kind of stuff went on. Lots of that stuff still goes on. But he gets put in there. He's also young, but also raised under the time of his father's reformations and, and uh, re remodeling of the temple and reestablishing the sanctuary services, being taught the difference between good and evil. We don't know if he's got the same mother as the other one. Maybe he does. His mother's not mentioned. He's given 11 years. Why the other one was only given three months, this one's given 11 years. But that's still not a lot of time. And he does evil in the sight of the Lord. Maybe it took him by surprise. No doubt the death of their father took both of them by surprise. And maybe he manipulated to get to the place of his brother, but maybe not. Maybe he was shocked there too. Maybe his dad dies and he's grieving that and then the next thing he knows his brother is taken captive after three months and the next thing he knows he's on the throne. And then his, son, his brother is taken to Egypt and dies there. He'd be grieving that if they had any good relation. And through all that, through seeing the difference between his father and what happened to his brother, knowing what happened to his grandfather, Manasseh, and great-grandfather, Hezekiah, he made choices. From the age of 25 and even before that, to 36, 11 years of reigning, to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Sad. And Josiah, a good king, goes down the record books as a good king doing right in the sight of the Lord. Unfortunately, had two rotten kids. Yeah, so you're going to be a good person. And the record books of heaven could say, you did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Doesn't say how he was a good father, good parent or not, but he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. The Bible says that. And worked reform in his heart and in his country, no doubt tried to do it in his home as well. And yet two rotten kids. At least two. Who knows what the rest of them were like if there were others. Sometimes we see, you know, people that get rotten kids, we blame the parent. And sometimes that might be true, and sometimes it might not be true. I mean, look at what Adam, God ended up with Adam and Eve, right? <laughs> you know? Look at what Adam and Eve ended up with Cain, right? So, I mean, you know. And I'm sure it would have broken Josiah's heart. I'm sure it was breaking his heart to know that these kids at their ages... We're not following the Lord. That's not Jehoiakim Kim or Jehoiakim. How would that get in there? <laughs> Anyone old enough to recognize that guy? Someone said it. Roger Starbuck. Roger Starbuck. Right, Roger Starbuck. <laughs> Some old people here. <laughs> the Dallas Cowboys picked Roger Starbuck and in a 10th round draft pick. That's pretty far down the road. Like, you know, there are a lot of picks before him. 10th round before he gets picked. In due to his four-year military commitment, he would not begin playing professional until 1969 as a 27-year-old rookie. That's pretty old for a rookie in football. And so no one wanted to pick him, even though he's pretty good in, in college. Uh, but you're not going to get him for another four years. Who knows? It could be a war. You could die in the war. You can get injured, you know. And here we wasted our pick on him. And so he does his four years in the military, practicing with the team as he can. And then at 27 years old. So then they also know not only is he not, not going to be around for four years and may never be around, by the time we do get him, he's going to be an old guy. And so in 1970, 
The starting quarterback, quarterback for Dallas Cowboys was Craig Morton, and he had led the team to Super Bowl V. So here's Rodgers sitting on the sidelines behind a Super Bowl quarterback. And what's the chances of him ever seeing the light of day? He's now 28. Slim to none. Slim to none. He's, he's now 28, and he's second stringer behind a Super Bowl quarterback. In 1971, Morton began the season as the starter, but in the week eight, so about halfway through the season, Storbach assumed the full-time quarterback duties. He's now about 29 years old, close to, close to 30, 29, very close to 30 and led the Cowboys to 10 consecutive victories, including their first Super Bowl victory. He's only one of seven quarterbacks to come off the bench and lead his team to a Super Bowl victory. During Storbach's 11 years, nine as starting quarterback, two on the bench, he led the Dallas Cowboys to five Super Bowls, winning two of them. I think the Cowboys have only been in about eight Super Bowls, and he led them to five of those eight in just 11 years, really just in about nine years. So what does that have to do with our Bible story tonight? <laughs> well, not the 11 year, 11 year. But no doubt, neither one of those kings Jehoiakim, or Jehoiahaz, was expecting to become king overnight. Neither one of them were expecting their dad to die when they were 23 or 25. No doubt they were just having a good time, 20-year-olds, living life as princes. Thinking their dad's going to reign a long time. And maybe someday when we're older, we'll become king. Maybe not even thinking about that at all. But overnight, things changed. And dad died. And one is thrust into the kingship. And after three months, the next one is there. Roger's sitting on the bench, well, four years in the military, waiting out his time. Then he gets there, and he's sitting on the bench. What do you think he was doing during those four years in the military? I think, well, at least I was picked. How dare they wait till the 10th round? I'm better than that, and I certainly was better than so-and-so who got picked in the ninth round or the eighth round and the guy in the seventh round and the guy in the sixth round. Shouldn't have signed up for this military duty. Just get it done. Think that's what his attitude was? Every moment he can get away from the military, he was at the field playing with the team. And how about that first year and a half or so sitting on the bench? Well, I'm never going to get to play anyway. Craig's the starter. I'm getting old now anyway. At least I got a uniform. I'll just sit here and eat some donuts. I think that was his attitude? Or you think every opportunity he's there throwing the football and throwing the football and throwing the football and getting ready for his opportunity for his chance. And then halfway through the season, after a winning season, he gets called off the bench, you're in. Like those other six quarterbacks that got called out from the bench to lead their team. There are seven who did that, and no doubt there are many others who got called from the bench and did worse than the guy before them, <laughs> or no better. We don't know when our time to shine is going to come. 
And when we're sitting on the bench, we need to be ready at all times, instant, in season, out of season, for what God's call upon us is always ready to give a reason for our beliefs. Always ready. We don't know when that question's going to come. We don't know when God is moving upon that co-worker or that co-student or that neighbor or that family member, and that moment is going to come. Some situation in their life is going to cause them to want to know something about God, and we need to be ready. And we need to be living the right life in front of them all the way along Oh, they may be cursing, they may be joking around, and they may be fooling around and sloughing off, and they may be just sitting around the water cooler doing nothing. They don't, probably don't have water coolers anymore, but whatever. Just sitting around, doing nothing. And are we participating with them? That they don't have anyone to go to when that time comes? When they don't see anything in us? that's desirable, and they don't see anything different in us, any peculiar people in us. We don't know when that moment's going to come. We don't know when their father is going to die. We don't know when their mother's going to die, or when their crisis is going to take place in their life, when their spouse is going to walk out on them, or their kid is going to come down with some disease. And they're going to want somebody to talk to. And we need to live lives all the time that are ready to take up that role and to be the one that they come to to ask for help, to ask for guidance, to ask for prayer. And we need to be spiritually ready every single day because we don't know when it's going to come. Roger didn't know when it was going to come. Jehoiakim didn't know when it was going to come. Jehoiahaz didn't know. And those two kings, those two kids, they weren't ready. They weren't ready spiritually, and they weren't ready to lead a nation. And they led the nation. They led the nation downhill and much closer to Babylon's destruction. Again, all of history could have been different if they would have made different choices. Both of them had good examples. And both of them blew it. We need to be ready now. We don't know how quickly. We know it's going to be quickly. I believe it's going to be very quickly. I believe it's going to be lightning. How quickly things are going to turn from peace and safety to sudden destruction coming upon this world. And we need to be ready now. Look back at the Holocaust and people say, it never happened in Germany. Never happened. The people won't let it happen. The chancellor won't let it happen. Can't be that bad. Things he wrote before, yeah, it can't be that bad. People won't let, they won't turn on us. And so rapidly, they didn't have time to make a change, many of them. Same in these last days. We live in peaceful now, but things are going to change rapidly. Now is the time to be spiritually ready. When the mark of the beast is being enforced upon people, that's not the time to start having a prayer life. That's not the time to start reading the Bible. That's not the time to start warning the world. In most cases, that would be the too late time. Now is the time. To be ready. Not just get ready, but to be ready. And stay ready. And be used in getting other people ready. And if these two kids would have been helping their father in his reforms, they would have been ready. They would have been tracking right along, allowing God to work in their own hearts and their own lives, and then assisting their dad in his work, how much easier Josiah's work would have been. And who knows, maybe he wouldn't have gone and fought against Pharaoh. Or maybe if they were there with him, he might not have died. Everything could have been different. 
It's interesting how the kings went to battle back then. Wouldn't that be nice today? If the leaders of the country had to, actually had to go out on the front lines, there'd be a lot less wars, I think. <laughs> I don't know why they don't do that anymore. <laughs> well, maybe I know why, but it'd be nice if they did that again. That's how I think it should be. That should be a mandated thing, right? You're going to call for war, all of Congress and the president, everyone has to go on the front lines first. <laughs> Let's go to war that way. Anyway, that's a tangent. All right, so back to uh, we need to be ready for the spiritual battle and the spiritual war that's there now and will come upon us if we can't imagine. A time of trouble such as the world has never seen is coming upon this world, and we need to be in the boot camp now. We need to be ready now. We need to be spiritually ready now. We need to be praying at all times now. We need to know the scriptures, not just intellectually, but in our hearts, and living it out now with godly fear. And then sharing with others and warning the world, because there's not much time left. Jerusalem and Judea was doing pretty great under Josiah. Revival and prosperity and things were good. And look at how quickly things changed. The next thing you know, they got Pharaoh as ruler, really. Now is the time to be ready, not resting in peace, sitting back, comfortable, thinking we're rich and increased in goods, and have need of nothing, and just coasting along. We need to be ready and prepare a world for what's coming upon this world. And if we think we're ready, we're really in trouble. How's the problem with Laodicea? He said we're rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, but they knew it not. So if we think we're okay, we're not okay. We need to be growing every moment and trusting in the Lord totally dependent in him and fully surrendered to him. For where we are weak, that's when we're strong. When we acknowledge our weakness before God, when we acknowledge our weakness to ourselves, then we can trust in him and rely on him and be strong in him. And thus the weaker we realize we are, then the stronger we will be in the Lord. We will depend on him. If we think we're okay and we think we're ready and we can handle anything, bring it on. Pride cometh before the fall. Lord, only by your grace. So as we pray tonight, let us ask God to search us Try us, get us ready, remove out of us everything that's not right. Any area there's a shortcoming that would come up upon us and be an overwhelming flood. Any area that we're not ready. Any area that we're not prepared to, to share God's love, to witness for him. Any area that we're not willing and able to lead, lead people to the Lord. Lead a godly walk that other people can follow. Is any area? Does any open door, Satan will enter that? Any crack, any area, even one thing lacking would cause the whole building to crumble down. So let's pray before the Lord and surrender to him. Let us rise up to the occasion and be active now as if this is our last time and last moment because it very well could be. Let us rise up to the occasion and warn this world and witness for him and win souls for his kingdom. 
Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, King of the universe, we're thankful that you've called us and you've called us now to be ready for you and active in service for you. Lord, we're thankful that you've given us everything we need to be ready. We're thankful that you've already paid the price. We're thankful, Yeshua, that you've come and given yourself for us. We're thankful that that you've made the atonement for us. We're thankful that you've paid the way and you've already poured out your spirit that we can be filled with him, that we can be cleansed of sin and cleansed of self. So do that in our lives. Thank you for already providing the means. Give us faith. Thank you for walking this life here on earth and showing the, giving us the example, showing us the way. Hold our hands and walk us through. Lord, convict us and show us our weaknesses so we can lean upon you and trust in you. Lord, without you, we can do nothing. But with you and through you, we can do all things. Lord, we give you permission to fill us. We give you permission to use us in bringing saving relationships to this world around us. In Yeshua's holy name. Amen.